And let me just go here. Okay. Now, what we've happened since December 2019 till today, um, and again, what happened in Jan, end of January, you are being all involved with all the news in that, uh, 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 months regarding um, this issue. I mean, for, for many of us, that has been um, a significant change um, for all of us regarding what, what exactly happening um, since December. But what happened in December 2019, as far as we know, um, in the, uh, Wuhan, which is a city in the Hubei area in China, there has been reporting of the very rapid progressive pneumonia, which was not um, similar the way that we see pneumonia in um, other bacterial or viral infection. And that's very important because initially we all thought about that this probably influenza outbreak, which we see every year. It's not the first time we actually see influenza every year um, in our in our country and um, and anywhere around the world. And we had a many outbreak. It actually we have a, a large case of uh, fatality in 2017 as well when we talk about uh, um, uh, what happened in uh, Wuhan and um also in um in the last years but what happened is a very rapid progressive pneumonia happened and technically made the people to die so quickly uh for this pneumonia and as you see here they actually had um, a change on the ct scan which is not a specific for coronavirus but something we see quickly they go to respiratory distress syndrome and they get this area on the CT scan, as you see in the picture, which we call ground glass opacity, and they need to be on ventilator and a high oxygen flow. And if they are lucky, they're able to survive. And if they're not, then we're going to end it up to a um, really severe situation and uh, high mortality. There was a lot of theory happened at the beginning that that was probably came from the wet market there originally from Bath, and the reason from Bath because we had history in 2003 with SARS, which um, originally came from Bath and um, 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 also uh, came to the human. And in China, they had an experience of the SARS outbreak back in 2003 and uh, 17 years ago. And they know about this situation, and that's why they were starting to um, kind of like be worried about um, that maybe this is a new source is happening. What happened is that um, in the month of January, there's a lot of questions about is it really person-to-person -person transmissions happening? And that's something that we're really not sure at that time, that is it really person-to-person -person, um, um, contamination at, at, the, at that area? But um, finally, we able to find that, no, this is a possibility of person-to-person -person, uh, transmission. And um, we had the pandemic um, 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 announcement from the World Health Organization. And our country, as of the March, um, hit it uh, significantly with this um, virus. Now, as far as we know, there is a possibility of intermediate um, animals as well, which is a pangolin. It's, um, it's, um, and they were saying because of the uh, skin uh, structures possibility that they're actually able to shedding the virus significantly. Now, what happened so far um, is that as far as we see till today, um, in Santa Clara um, so far, this is May 11, but in Santa Clara so far we had total case of above 2,000 and uh, we have around like 129 deaths so far and currently hospitalized for one or two people in Santa Clara County. Uh, worldwide, the number is actually very different. In total, we have above of the 4 million people, they actually got this infection. And around um, 200, uh, above of 200,000, almost close to 300,000, they actually died of the coronavirus. In the United States, we have uh, sadly about 1 million people. Um, it's getting close to become one and a half million and um, 83,000 so far mortality with this um, situation. Um, Santa Clara County is one of the highest um, amount. When we are actually in the first county that has started to um, uh, being um, 
um, uh, doing the shelter in place when we had the initial of the virus. What we see in um, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, is the structure of this virus, because when we look at the full genome sequencing and analysis of this virus, um, um, which initially is a SARS-CoV-2, and then later we actually name it COVID-19 because of 2019, um, is, a, is kind of like a better coronavirus. We know the better coronavirus very well. Again, we had the SARS back in 2003, and I'm talking about we had the MERS as well. But technically, they cause severe respiratory syndrome. That's what we call it, SARS, and a severe acute respiratory syndrome, and because of this virus. But it's a very similar to SARS that we had in 2003, but a little bit different in structure, different claim. Um, it's a structure is very uh, similar to, to, to any kind of coronavirus, but one of the specific things about this virus, as you see in the picture, um, is actually going to be this spike um, of this virus I'm showing in the pen as well. And this is kind of make it as a corona. But this is spike is kind of like a specific, especially when it goes to the this enzyme, uh, this receptors, which is entered to the cells, which is um, angiotensin um, enzyme. And that's kind of like angiotensin converting enzyme two for cell entry that we discussed last time when you were on presentation. And this is a typical structure for this virus. As we see from 2003, 2012, 2003, we have SARS-CoV not COVID-2, but it, it caused the severe acute respiratory syndrome, as you see. But in 2012, we actually had um, um, the MERS. As you probably know, Mediterranean um, East uh, or, or Middle East respiratory syndrome, uh, another better coronavirus, um, is um, happened in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and actually has a very high case fatality rate. I will say probably more than um, COVID-19 that we are experiencing right now. But the issue is that we have less people infected with that. They're able to contain this virus so fast in e Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And that's why there are, te technically, we haven't heard from the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome anymore. A problem with the COVID-19 is that, um, I think, first of all, it happens in, in, in Asia. And because of the global economy, there was a high chance that this virus able to spread around the world. Um, and that's one of the reasons that um, it was harder to contain this virus as well. The other things is the virulence of this virus. It's um, the, what we call it r not of this virus. This virus is able to infect many people so quickly. And that's the other things about the COVID-19 in compare of the MERS. But MERS has actually high uh, mortality rate. Um, as far as we know. Now, you all knowing it that how this virus is able to be um, spread around and um, uh, transmission, which we discussed about it. Um, so far, I can say the exact mode of the person to person actually spread of this uh, SARS CoV 2 is, is still unclear. Um, we know that uh, through the respiratory droplet that we so far we know, definitely, the same thing that we have in influenza, uh, we had this uh, transmission happen. Uh, when we have droplet transmission, uh, virus release in the respiratory secretion that we have, like in our nose, in our, in, in our mouth. And the, uh, when the person that who is infected is going to cough, sneeze, or talk to infected person, um, technically, if, if it makes direct contact with the mucous membrane, infection can happen in the people, or if the people, person touch an infected surfaces, and um, and that person touch his eyes, nose, and mouth, they actually can get infected. Um, we know the droplet in te uh, theory that don't travel more than six feet and is around two meter, and usually they don't linger in the air. Um, this is why it's important to always make the six weeks because of the droplets uh, precaution at that point. But um, airborne route, which is becomes one of the issue that we have, it's something that initially we really didn't know that this is the airborne. But what we see um, later uh, through the sum of the culture, we found that this virus can stay in the um, closed area in the air for three hours. 
And that makes uh, some of the situation that initially happened that um, if you are in the store or if you are in the airplane and somebody is sneeze and cough, that actually virus can stay for three hours. I think we discussed in my first presentation, which I had with you and Karen did group, um, that it can stay. And we I share some of the uh, pictures from New, New England Journal of Medicine that how this virus can actually stay for four hours, three, three hours actually in the air. It's not in the open space area and in more enclosed area, which if you are with somebody in the same room, um, you have to think about that possibility of two to three hours. There are some of the other things that we know that, for example, it can definitely go to pieces. Um, we have seen initially when the virus started in, even in the Wuhan, uh, we have people that actually only presented with diarrhea. And through the diarrhea, they able to, uh, they're actually shedding the virus. And if they don't wash their hand and they touch the surfaces, they can easily um, um, contaminate the surfaces of because of their uh, contamination of their hand if they're um, not washing their hands with soap and water. That brought some concern about eating outside because if somebody is preparing the food for you and has a, a GI manifestation, which is gastrointestinal manifestation like diarrhea, or if they're not washing their hand appropriately and if they touch the food, if they touch the dishes or utensil and you actually put them in your mouth or touch them, there's a high chance to also you can get infected as well. Um, this is that even in the New York, there was a lot of discussion about grocery markers as well, markets as well, that some of the uh, people are working, maybe they'll be contaminated and they're asymptomatic, they only had GI symptoms or like diarrhea, and they um, transmitted this uh, um, infections from one person to other people. Uh, but as far as we know that some of the thinks that like this virus can stay for up to three days in plastic. Um, if you are buying something from stores, you have to think about it. If, even if you are opening uh, from the, if you're getting out this stuff from the plastic bag, it can stay for three days on the plastic bag. And you have to be careful about that, put the plastic bag away for probably more than 72 hours. And then you, you can touch that plastic bag. If you don't, if you don't have if you're not able to uh, clean that uh, plastic bag. Plastic is actually one of the things that is stay for a long time. Some people actually, um, some initial studies shows that can stay in metal up to six to nine days. If there is a metal surface and uh, this virus can stay there, it can stay for six to nine days. But if there is no contamination, if, if there's no contact or touch happens, this virus is gonna die because this virus is RNA virus and RNA virus always need a host. If they cannot find the host, um, they will die. And that's why if you leave anything for, like, for example, if you buy something and you leave it for like two to three days outside and then you go and touch it, you should be fine. You don't need to really use a bike or anything because that virus hasn't found any host and actually is going to die. Um, it also, so, um, so far, we've seen this virus. Um, it's presented in blood and we see that in the blood donors. Um, and there have been detected some RNA virus as well. That brought a concern, um, especially for the last one month, about um, the blood donors and transfusion of the blood as well. This is the area of the research right now, and a lot of people actually are doing research um, um, about this as well. But I just want to tell you that this virus is um, can be can be highly um, contamination as well. Now. Uh, we know that SARS-CoV-2 initially started to transmit it from human to animal host. I mean, we think about bat, we think about pangolin, we think about the snake, but um, we really don't know the ongoing risk of transmission through the animal um, so far. This is a certain or not. There is no evidence suggested um, that domestic animals are a major source of infections um, uh, in humans. There have been some rare reports that we've seen SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, including asymptomatic infection in dogs and also in cats, um, following close contact with uh, their owner if they have COVID-19. And they are having the COVID-19 and they tested the dogs and cats and they found, oh, interesting, they also have a COVID-19. Um, even they have been asymptomatic, the animals. And, um, it shows that actually in animals, they can have inside their nose 
they can have uh, the virus can actually stay there and replicate, um, especially in the cats. Cats, um, they're, they're like to really replicate in cats more than dogs. And, but they haven't seen in the pigs and poultry. Um, that was one of the big discussion initially that because you probably hear about some of the um, um, uh, processing meat area has been closed, but not because of um, there have been um, uh, poultry has been infected because the people have been infected and they've been clo work so close to each other. And that's why they just technically was human to human um, uh, transmission. But one thing we know that we're still very uncertain regarding the transmission risk from the animals. A CDC is still recommended to uh, having the pets keep away from other animals or people outside of the household and uh, people with confirmed or suspect COVID-19 uh, try to avoid close contact with the household pets if there is any member of the household has infection. And that's very, very important to um, remember that. Um, I will say probably if you have a friends that has COVID-19 and if they have a dogs and cats in their house, um, if they ask you to um, uh, take care of them for a couple of weeks while they're sick, that's not a good idea to take to bring them to your house because it's a possibility that they have a virus in their nose and they can easily um, get you infected as well. What is scary about this virus? I can say is uh, after years of experience, my biggest concern, this is not my personal, but all the physician as well, is that I've never seen um, any virus like this can affect in asymptomatic people. When I, when I deal with influenza, my life is so easy because influenza always has symptoms. Um, you either have cough, fever, a sneezing, or many other symptoms. But when you deal with the COVID-19, this is exactly the problem. Many people, they have this problem and they have no symptoms, not at all, no fever, no cough, no sneezing, but they're still infected. Um, we've seen um, some of the study, like for example, the COVID-19 outbreak in the skilled nursing home from the 48 uh, residents of a skilled nursing home, 27 of them, which is 56%, they had positive screening tests but they've been absolutely asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis. And 24 of these people, ultimately in the next seven days, they showed the symptoms. But for that window of seven days, there were no symptoms. I mean, nobody knows even they're sick. This is exactly the problem that we are facing. I mean, I have some slides that I'm sharing with you, but one of the biggest issues we have is or in our facilities, the skilled nursing home, assistant living and memory care units, board and care places. Many people, um, they're working their staff, they're absolutely asymptomatic, but they can have the virus shedding for weeks, a couple weeks, some of them even three weeks. And um, we've seen the same similar experience in, um, um, in the cruise ship that you remember initially in month of the end of February, that was most of people there, they were there, they had no symptoms, but they're all positive in the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that's going to be one of the big, this is exactly the reason that we see a lot of the governments right now. Um, and even here in the states and governors, they're trying to push back of opening up the businesses because they, we all worry about the asymptomatic people and they can easily uh, um, um, shred this virus. Um, yesterday, um, Dr. Fauci was talking with Senate um, um, and he actually said something that is absolutely right. This virus is only four months old virus. We really don't know about the nature of this virus. We don't know that what's going to happen to this virus. Is it going to be more mutation to become more virulent? Or as this virus is finding new hosts, it's going to be either less danger or more danger. We really don't know. I have some slide to share with you, but we see definitely this virus has been mutated. As you probably hear, even right now, has been affecting the children, which it hasn't been so far. That means this virus is definitely changing the structures. And um, as you probably know, so far we are four months right now, but this virus, like um, we know that once, twice a month actually, this virus has been changed the structure. 
the virus that we're dealing right now is not the same virus that been in Wuhan in December 2019. The structure has been changed significantly. This virus, this is the typical for RNA viruses. They, this is the reason that you, every year when you get influenza vaccine, you're still getting influenza because the influenza virus is changing the structure. It's the same influenza virus is RNA virus. The RNA virus has changed this structure quickly. They're so smart. They know how to change the structure, as I discussed in my first presentation um, um, a month ago, that how they change the structure so smart in order to be protected from the immune system. Now, this virus also has been changed because it found new hosts with the new environments, new genetic, and that's why they're changing the structure um, and it seems this virus it becomes more virulent. We don't know yet, but some of people actually think the way that actually is acting, even affecting the children as well, that maybe this virus is going to be more virulent. If we are lucky as a human, if this virus does a mistake, and in the changing the structure become less virulent and less dangerous, then we are very lucky because then we can able to definitely contain this virus. And it happens to many other viruses in our human history. Some of them, they actually mutate in the better way that become less infected, less dangerous. But we, we're going to see, we all going to see how this virus going to act. Um, the life of human is all depends on how this RNA virus going to actually change their game. And this is the virus is actually putting everything on the table. And it's really in the hand of this virus right now. Um, we know um, a lot of the questions, I try to answer some of the questions you may have. Um, how long if I exposed to this virus, I may going to have a symptoms? It's really a depends, but in um, what we see the incubation period, it's probably within 14 days in some people in five days and some people in uh, like 11 days, uh, some of them in 14 days. We have seen some of the cases that even they got the virus, but they haven't showing the symptoms even the weeks after, like three to four weeks. But the majority of the cases within the five or 11 days, if they're going to be symptomatic, they're going to show the symptoms, unless if they're going to be asymptomatic and they're never going to show the symptoms. And this is something that um, we, we can definitely see um, in that. But um, some of the cases, even after 14 days, as I discussed, but how long this virus can stay? in or nose area, um, it's very interesting because in some of the cases, even 40 days, 50 days, even after they get infected, we still see some people are positive and they're still, when we do the nose swab, I actually had one of my own patients uh, that um, five weeks is still positive. And uh, finally yesterday he turned negative. After five weeks, even he has no symptoms, but he still had the virus in his nose. And we, we, we were doing the swab in Stanford every three days. And um, finally, it just turned negative. But it's, it's been very, very, I, I hear the lady in New York actually had this virus for uh, uh, 76 days. And she's been symptomatic for 76 days, which is a long time. I mean, 76 days of fever, cough, and many other symptoms as well. Um, some of the symptoms that we may uh, see in people, and you probably some of you also um, uh, saw it in the past, is fever. Uh, they feel fatigue and feeling tired, uh, dry cough in only 59%, low appetite, um, muscle pain, myalgia, dyspnea, which is a shortness of breath in 31%, and only 27% they can have phlegm when they cough. Let me talk about fever because a lot of people, they think that they should have a fever. Fever is a 99% when they are symptomatic. However, it's only 40% of the people showing they have fever um, in the initial of the presentation. I mean, 60% of people, they don't have a fever. That brought a big concern because you probably know if you go to the airports right now or any, any hospitals or any places, um, they actually have the thermal detector or they check your temperature. There was a lots of argue here that not everybody with COVID they're going to have a fever. And how are you going to know if somebody has a COVID-19 infection and doesn't have a fever? Mainly, maybe only has some muscle pain, mild muscle pain, or feeling a little bit tired, but no fever. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that we wanted to say, that checking the temperature is important. I think it's very important we need to do it. But it's not necessary if somebody doesn't have a fever, it means it doesn't have the coronavirus. They still can have a coronavirus and, um, and, and even they, 
only 60% of people, they can have cough. 40% of people, they don't have cough at all. Um, other symptoms that we see with that, we talk about a loss of a smell, it happened. Um, loss of taste, it happened. Uh, some people have uh, less happened. Runny nose, it's not very common in coronavirus. Some people have headache. Um, but very interesting is that um, we've seen, especially in, in the virus that we see in Europe and also um, United States, not the one that we've seen in China, many people, they actually presented with a stroke-like symptom. They exactly like they have a stroke and nobody knows, oh, this is a stroke, but this is the coronavirus. This is why American Academy of Neurology made a statement that anybody present with the stroke this days check for coronavirus because they may have only coronavirus and not necessarily they're having a stroke. Um, we see a lot of people with dementia, they only have change of mental status. Even normal people, they can have a little bit more confused, um, even hallucinating, delusional, and that can be only presentation of this virus, which is amazing. And that's very interesting about this virus as well. And again, as I discussed, some people only present with um, diarrhea. And that's something that uh, we've seen so far. 81% um, of people, they only can have mild symptoms and they never develop pneumonia. But um, some people uh, can have um, severe cases, which is going to be pneumonia. This is, the, this is the time that we recommend that you come to the hospital. Because the mild cases, you really don't need to be in a hospital because they're technically not doing anything. It's just going to be self-limited. But when the pneumonia happened, they're going to have shortness of breath, low oxygen. And then what we see in the CT scan of the lung, we see that definitely, as the picture I show initially, uh, we see some um, um, starting of the pneumonia. And some of the cases, around 5%, they can go to something we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a nightmare of us as a doctor. And, uh, uh, and that means that a body is start to overreact to this virus and a loss of inflammatory cells going to be released and as a consequence the people is going to go on their ventilator and these people they have a very high mortality and this, these are the people actually they die so quickly. A lot of people they have more high risk and, and unfortunately it happens in more older adult population because they have all this risk factor and some of them may have some of them. Anybody with cardiovascular disease, anybody has high blood pressure history, the reason is because of the stiffness of blood circulation, it can increase risk of the more severe disease in them, 10% of them. Anybody has history of a smoking in the past, even they been, haven't been a smoker for a long time because they had some scar tissue in the lung, they can be very, very good case for severe cases as well. Do any people have more obesity? It was actually released, I think I saw it yesterday at CNN, there was a report about more cases with obesity linked to high mortality. Anybody has a kidney problem because we see the people with severe disease, they actually goes to the kidney failure. If somebody has already kidney failure, it's actually going to be more double risk for that. And anybody with cancer, especially have blood cancer, lung cancer, or anybody has metastasis anywhere in the body, they're very, very high risk that this virus is going to show any um, 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 more severe manifestation. And definitely the people with diabetes as well. Some of the questions that we learned for the last months that when can I be out of isolation? Um, if we did a test um, and we know that somebody is positive, any time when we have no fever without using of any fever medication, if we do the test, like for example, we do the test and the test, it becomes negative and there's no fever, and there's no, there's no symptoms of cough and shortness of breath, that person can be out of isolation if we do the test. And negative test results is going to be um, two tests that technically collected in more than 24 hours, like I do the test today, and I also do another test tomorrow, two tests negative, and I check with you, do you have any fever, and you have used any Tylenol for the last 24 hours, and the answer is no, and there is have any cough and shortness of breath, no, then you can be, you are free, you can be out of prison, you can be out of isolation and you don't need to be there. But if we don't do a test, like for example, an area we don't have a test, we're looking at the symptoms. If somebody has seven days that no symptoms at all, as we discussed, especially in the last 72 hours, 
there is no respiratory symptoms. There is no fever with using, without using of Tylenol, without using of Advil, without using of Naprosyn or Aleve, and you have no fever, no cough, then you can actually be out of isolation. And at least seven days since uh, the symptoms have, have first started, that that person can be out of isolation if you don't have any tests. But in California, we have tests available. And if we do the test and we have no symptoms, we can be out of isolation. Some people says that I have test positive. I don't have any symptoms. That's true. Uh, what should I do? Um, can I be out of isolation? Home isolation for these people um, is for seven days after they have their first test positive, as long as they have no symptoms. Like if I have, if I do a test, no swab today, and I'm positive, but I have no symptoms, I can be out of isolation after seven days if I have no symptoms in that seven days. I don't need to stay for another two weeks um, and if I my test is positive. Now, we know that um, there are many um, uh, tests that we can do as far as uh, finding the uh, COVID-19 right now. And as you probably know that RT-PCR, which is a detection of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA by nucleic acid amplification tests, it's uh, something we call reverse transcript or polymerase chain reaction. This is called RPCR. This is the same thing they do no swap. Um, one of the most important things that where we should get the sample. And the samples right now we're doing is on the nose or, or, or in the mouth, especially in the pharyngeal area. It definitely needs to be collected by healthcare professional. There is a nasal swab uh, specimen from um, um, the front of the uh, nose. Either can be done by the healthcare provider, or you probably hear that some of the kits available to do it at home. In the United States, uh, FDA actually has granted emergency use authorization for home collection testing kit. Um, can be mailed to the laboratory for testing. And um, the other things is that technically the nasal wash or mouthwash area that by healthcare professional, these are the things is so important. Um, one of the big problem that we have, it's some people are negative, but they have a symptoms. We've seen a lot at the beginning of the March, I've been um, getting many calls from many facilities that we have many staff that they have fever, cough, they definitely have all the COVID positive things, but the tests are negative. Why? And then we retest again them in the next couple of days and they became positive. Number one is a poor quality swabs. And uh, it doesn't mean if somebody is negative is negative, unless if you don't have symptoms. If you have the symptoms and your test is negative, it doesn't mean that you don't have COVID. It's a possibility you still have it. It's so important, which is according to CDC and also um, Society of Infectious Disease, that you, if somebody is symptomatic, means has the symptoms, but the nasal test is negative, try to do collection from other area. Like if you do the last time nose, try to do exactly in the back of the pharyngeal area, back of the mouth, and also try to collect a little bit more deeper. And the other thing is just don't forget, RNA virus is very, very sensitive virus. It's, uh, it can degrade so fast. The collection is very, very important. And the person in the labs who does the test, it's so important. Quick um, injury to the virus when they're putting in the tube and sending to the lab can make the test negative. And that's why it's so important that people are being well trained when they do RT-PCR. Um, and it's a very tricky thing to do RT-PCR. Um, that's why it is very, very important to understand if somebody is negative but has symptoms, it doesn't mean that person is absolutely negative. That symptoms are so important. We need to do that. Unless if somebody is negative, asymptomatic, and we cross our finger and say, okay, well, that was a test. It was negative, and now we accept it as negative. A lot of you guys are really um, looking for serolo uh, serology tests, um, which is the IgM and IgG. Currently, they're actually doing it at Stanford, and you can actually do this test. There are many tests actually has been um, um, doing so far to looking at the serology test, um, which is technically showing the antibody. What happened is that um, spike protein that I show you on the first picture, our immune system is starting to producing antibody against this virus. Um, 
12 days for IgM, 14 days for IgG. When the symptoms start, the first antibody that is actually going to go up is going to be IgM. In the first weeks, the symptoms start. Um, again, 40% we can have detectable antibody. Um, by day 15, IgM and IgG definitely is detectable. IgM in 94%, IgG in 80%. But um, it's a very, um, and then IgM is going to be disappear, and IgG is going to stay for a while. And for a while, we don't know how long, because that's exactly going to be the question that how long the people can be, can having this IgG in their system. We see some people actually, they are um, um, converting their IgG to become negative after weeks, maybe a month, maybe eight weeks. Maybe they can stay for two to three months if they're very lucky. And that IgG means that our body already developed antibody against this virus. And, um, and if the same strain of the virus, <coughs> I'm not talking about another mutation, if the same strain of this virus again exposed to your body, you are more likely, I'm not saying 100%, are protected. Um, this is exactly the area that a lot of researchers are doing research. Um, they were thinking about that, uh, doing a massive antibody test to see what's the percentage of population they have IgG in their system. They have been exposed to this virus and they're still able to go back to the work or they can open up the economy. The problem is that not all the kits are accurate. We've seen a lot of the problem with the kit accuracy, that is the really right test to do or not. The other problem is that as this test is, this virus is also mutate, do, doing the mutation, um, you may have IgG against one, um, um, uh, one type of this virus or a strain of this virus, if I use a better word, and then you may not gonna have the same IgG to a different strain of this virus. And the other question now the scientist has that, what are the, what's the prolonged, what, how long this IgG can stay in our system, which is a still, because it's a four months old virus, we really don't know about it. We know for influenza that we do not have for a long time, and we can easily, sometime maybe after months or usually after the season is going to be finished, then we can expose to the virus and we can actually get virus again. But um, the, the, the speed of the mutation, um, it would for this virus, it's very uh, scary and concerning so far. There are some of the other tests that right now they're doing it. There's a new antigen test and they're under development. Um, rapid antigen test for respiratory pathogen um, is less sensitive than um, RT-PCR to detecting viral nucleic acid. Several manufacturers are right now in, in, in the United States, they're selling rapid point of care tests based on antigen testing, or antibody detection. But World Health Organization currently are not recommending this test because there's still a problem with accuracy and um, absence of the validation of the studies as well is so important. Should we test anybody for influenza at the same time? The answer is yes, because influenza is circulating in the community and it's very reasonable that anybody has the symptoms be also testing at the same time for influenza as well. Currently, there is no vaccine available for this coronavirus. Uh, uh, probably a commercially available vaccine is available within a year or a year and a half from now. Don't forget RNA is RNA virus. RNA virus, I repeat again, undergo mutation. Means they can change quick frequently uh, many times. And the rate of this mutation for COVID-19 is two mut mutation per month, which we discussed. And this is, uh, again, it's, um, um, it's 100 times faster than DNA viruses, but we have to understand that um, this viruses can be, uh, um, again, um, uh, 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 problematic. But re re right now there's many um, uh, factories are actually working and um, doing a lot of research to do more um, 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 doing, especially in the, um, um, Oxford in England, they actually thinking about September and October, they may have some uh, vaccines available. The problem is doing this vaccines on, um, at, at people and, and that's, um, and really validating a study because it's, um, RNA virus 
can be dangerous as well I think when it comes to the vaccine form. We really need to have better guarantee that if this virus is going to be safe to using, especially in older adult people or in uh, children, um, are we going to end up with the loss of side effect and mortality if we have the vaccines as well? These, these are the concerns that we discussed. Uh, I don't want to go on detail, but so far about medications, uh, one of the things that we see the plasmophoresis of this um, um, people, as we discuss about the protective antibody um, and IgG, uh, definitely for people they just got infection, um, it's been it's been positive. I'm not saying 100% the transfusion of the plasma to people that they have active infection and severe disease has been changed in life. But there's we we see we hear a lot of good stories about the um, um, transfusion. Of the plasma infected people, your in all the medication that is going on, um, remdesivir, which is the initial medication that has been designed for fighting with Ebola by Gliad Company, it showed some promising um, in people with a severe disease, and it's definitely helped with mortality and uh, helping them to be less affected, um, at least um, um, duration of the symptoms has been significantly lower. Uh, initially, I think one of the things that happened also in the uh, COVID-19 task, uh, task force in, um, um, in Washington and uh, President Trump uh, um, announced about the hydroxychloroquine, which is a malaria medication, um, so we uh, the initial uh, I think I, I, I lots of physicians, including myself, we brought this concern about the safety of the hydroxychloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine. It's a uh, it's very tricky to use it in certain population, especially in older adult population, because it especially in the combination of azithromycin antibiotic that they've done in France, that um, combination can have a very high cardiac toxicity and cause heart arrhythmia. I, I personally uh, didn't have, I haven't recommended to any of my own patients that they got COVID to be on this medication. And it was a wise decision so far. Uh, we see a lot of people, they actually, they had heart arrhythmia because of using of this medication. I think more studies going to come and showing that not only that hasn't been affected, but also a more case of fatality because of this. We talk about immunity after exposure um, initially. The other chaos is happening is in nursing home industry. You probably hear that. And uh, one of the air, a problem with the nursing home industry that we know it's because of uh, uh, many, uh, many issues that I'm explaining in the next slide. Um, so far till today, I was with reported yes, reporter yesterday in California Matters, and I think they quoted me on that. Um, the highest number of mortality so far all around the world being in a skilled nursing home and assistant living and care home population. And even not older adult people in the home, they're in more safe. The people being in facility, they have the highest number of the mortality. In um, half of the death happened in entire Europe, including France, Spain, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, Belgium, Around 57% being the people been either in the care home, board and care, memory care, skilled nursing home. The same thing in New York. More than 50% of the mortality being the people living in the nursing home or any care facilities. These are the places that actually goes as an incubator of that. Um, uh, the Guardian had an article uh, beginning of the May that in United Kingdom, the death in the nursing home can be five times higher than the government is actually announcing it. But why? It's not because of neglect. It's because of infrastructure and design. Um, nursing home industry hasn't been uh, designed to be a place for um, 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 treatment of the acute respiratory syndrome. Um, um, it's never been. A skilled nursing home, now it's become because more aging population is there. They don't have enough staff they don't have enough uh, qualified nurses even qualified physicians even um, 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 lack of the personal protective equipments like masks gowns they haven't they, ha they didn't have anything beginning of march 
uh, we've been a group of the geriatrician and the doctors and many other volunteers to actually try to help our facilities to give them even like a 10 face mask, um, couple N95. They have nothing. They've never been designed to uh, face the pandemic and this crisis in the past. This is what we've learned so far that our nursing home industry are so vulnerable. As you probably know, majority of the nursing home uh, industry are uh, private, they are for profit, and they are um, never pay attention to, and I'm not talking about only a skilled nursing home, but even a skilled assistant living facility and care homes as well, they never pay attention to that. The population they are serving, they are very, very vulnerable and high risk. Um, they need to prepare for that, they need to have a very skilled staff. They need to have appropriate education. They need to have continuous education and guidance for caring of this very vulnerable population that they're dealing with. They haven't. Um, none of the staff in the skilled nursing home, uh, assistant living facility and uh, boarding care. I mean, the skilled nursing home at least much better than assistant living facility and boarding care because they're even not medical facility, but they're acting as medical facility these days or memory care units, they're all acting as a medical facility these days, but they don't have the staff that they are qualified to really acting in the, in, in the medical facility. These are the things that we know that already been there. And I think in the last two to three months, we've seen this situation um, came in the uh, front of eyes of public right now, that where are the problems and what we need to do. The other things that we, need to specifically um, pay attention to it, that a skilled nursing home industry can easily overwhelm our hospital industry so fast. If, um, if two or three local skilled nursing home in our area, they have all the people with the COVID-19 severe symptoms, entire emergency room of Sequoia Hospital, Stanford and El Camino Hospital will be full of the patients. And there are going to be absolutely um, overwhelmed situation in the hospital emergency rooms, something that we never thought that that, that can happen. Lack of PPEs, as I discussed about it, really a majority, uh, even till today that you and I are talking, majority of a skilled nursing home, assistant living facility, they're using plastic bags as a gown and they really don't have the personal protective equipment as well. Um, the other things that I'm extremely worried about, it, I, I think I was quoted today in the San Jose Mercury, I think it was today, it was published. I'm very worried about the visitor restrictions. It is very, very important. We have to do visitor restrictions and because we don't have enough testing. But I'm extremely worried about the population that are living in assistant living facility and memory cares and they're not able to see their loved one. The care managers are not able to see their clients, which that the only person they see in their life. Think about you have a partner with dementia and you're not able to see your partner for two to three months. And then the other things, many of people in assistant living facility, they are, they are suffering from depression. They get more agitated. I mean, look at us. We all got the depression and agitation for the last two to three months because of all this shelter in place situation. Think about these people that are very, very vulnerable. And they are, um, they have a, a really, really worsening of depression and many other symptoms is happening. In them. It's very, um, um, worrisome. I think that I can, I can definitely see if the sheltering place kind of continue this, this way and the visitor restrictions for facilities. I'm actually expecting a wave of the many older adult people with worsening of depression and anxiety and become more frail and, and um, in the next months and years from now. And um, the other things that I'm worried that many of um, us as a family member or physician, um, the physician is still to go and see the patient, but many of the family members or, or care manager, they're able to see their, their patients in their facility and they're able to protect them from abuse and neglect. Right now, nobody is uh, seeing them. Nobody knows if they are eating well. Nobody knows that they are cleaning them very well. I'm sure that they do. I mean, we trust them. But I, I think that the supervision is not there. Um, and a state also haven't provided at least the staff to go to facility and visit them. Suggestion of the things that we need to do, definitely we need to have um, more testing, number one. Um, I'm, 
I'm kind of disappointed at the beginning of the task force in um, Oval Office that for weeks they never mentioned anything about testing in a skilled nursing home and facilities. But finally, I think last three, four weeks when they see a lot of mortality in New York, they already start to talking about it. But even till today, we still, um, even yesterday, uh, Governor um, Nielsen announced about the testing. And still, they haven't addressed that they need to do massive testing in this population. This is the population that I will see the second wave. I promise you, if you see the second wave in this area, that will be the population. A skilled nursing home, assistant living facility, these are the people going to be going to see significant second wave and third wave. And this is the population that we need to protect. The other things that we need to um, have the staff, which is usually in a skilled nursing home, one nurse cover 18 patients. And, and they have, they have, they have to work in two to different three facilities in order to make a life living in Bay Area. Um, and we, they can, they don't have the paid sick leave. Um, we need to have a new regulation that if they feel sick, they stay home and be able to pay them. And we have a replacement system for them that come and take over the ship without jeopardizing their life. The, these these are the regulations that we learned from this COVID-19 for the last months that has been broken so far. We need to change it right away. Otherwise, it's not about COVID-19. Influenza is going to come in, um, in fall. Another infection is going to come in the next months. We need to have uh, something to, to be done. Definitely, there's a, lots of issues about second wave. We learned about 1918, a Spanish flu pandemic, that actually the number of the death was higher was on the second wave, not on the first wave. And, and as that, this is absolutely true. And we, we see already in the last three days in South Korea and Germany, um, there are been a starting to have a second wave when they start to open again. And for older adult populations are the highest risk right now, especially as the community is going to be a start to opening. Many of them, they're exposed with many staff, many symptomatic people. They have all comorbidities that they can have. If we wanted to fight with second wave, this is the picture. I think you probably many of you heard in the news. That was last Saturday. There was one of the doctors from UCSF took the picture. This is United Airlines leaving San Francisco Saturday to New York. Supposed to be all the middle seats to be empty. And there was been supposed to be two, two row as actually not having any passengers. This is if that the picture is going to happen. And it was like three days ago, four days ago. Believe me. We're going to have second and third wave massively with more cases and more mortality. Think about that many of people in New York, they are traveling to California and they have the virus is still there. Maybe they're still infected, even they don't have fever and they bring in the virus here in this area. We bringing the virus to the other area. If this again, the Wuhan, at least when they become successful, um, relatively successful, they completely shut off the uh, transportation for months, airplane, um, um, salt bay, many things, and train. Nobody able to travel from Wuhan to any other part of the China. Um, but right now, there's many flights is flying. Even right now, you and I are talking, and the passengers come. And having a face mask on the face, that's not going to solve the problem. As you probably know, face mask is protecting some of the droplet, but this virus is still can spread around. And um, and the other picture I couldn't put it is a time of landing when everybody stand up to get the luggage from their um, um, again the overhead. It was disaster. Now this is uh, this is very concerning. And the other things is very concerning is rethinking of the COVID nineteen in children. As we discussed, we have already um, I think three or two five deaths so far of the kids in New York. It's definitely showing this virus has been um, mutating and it's very concerning because it actually caused a, a polyinflammatory syndrome um, similar to Kawasaki. I think yesterday they're talking in Senate as well uh, that that brings a concern that um, we were thinking so far the children's not going to have mortality, although I mean the number is low, but it's very concerning if we are opening the area and the people are going to get exposed. What's going to happen to the children? Are we going to have more, more, more mortality in the children as well, which is very, very big concern. Now, the last slide is where we do go from here. I think the most important thing for all of us to understanding the story hasn't been finished. Although we have low number of the cases right now, but think about it. We've been uh, from March 16. We've been in sheltering place for many weeks right now. 
as the as the things going to be lifted and people's going to go to to outside this story of this virus is hasn't been finished we need to continue to protect ourselves and others from this infection we need to really walk so wise and smart and really think about this is not the end of the um, um, situation. There's, there is a high possibility that we can have a second wave. Everybody, including the director of CDC, they're thinking about fall. It will be the time for the second wave. We need to be carefully think about second wave in month of fall. And especially when the influenza break is going to come at the same time. It's a possibility that we can have a second wave very soon in the next couple of months. We need to make sure that we continue having, I'm not saying not going outside, but we need to, for example, when we go outside, we need to have uh, uh, the social distancing, washing the hands, all the protections that we think about, even when we're buying anything from outside, we still think about that can be infected, doing all the procedures to protect ourselves. And just be cautious for the next month. This story of this virus probably going to stay with us for maybe years, maybe a couple of years, maybe a year, maybe two years. Uh, I don't know, maybe going to be more. I mean, I just a lot of scientists, they have different. Um, we don't, we're not sure when the vaccine is going to be available. And the, this morning we had just discussion in the Stanford, but we don't know if the vaccine is going to be effective as well. We really don't know because there's no study. We have to wait and see how the situation is going to be. I think even when this vaccine is going to start, we're not going to see effectiveness of the vaccines probably for another year. It means the story of the COVID-19 will be probably going to be with us for another couple of years. And we have to be careful for, for whatever we do. Now, I put it this, uh, no time to grieve for roses. I, the reason I brought it up uh, this one, um, some of you may know that at the beginning of pandemic, I lost my mother. And, um, and it was very heartbreaking, and, but it was exactly the day of the uh, pandemic announced. At the same day, I also lost my cousin who was the ER, who was the pediatric physician and, um, 51 year old because of COVID-19 and he left behind of the two little children. And, um, but in trust, I mean, I think that what, I don't know what's about the life, but I've never had a, um, uh, the pandemic was like a storm in my life. I've been um, uh, doing every single day and nights to uh, helping the, and again, uh, especially protecting many of this uh, uh, or older adult population, helping the facilities and never had a peaceful time to even think about my memories of myself and my mother as well. But I think that's the storm that happened to us. Uh, I'm, I'm writing this story about what happened to me uh, personally with COVID-19 and the loss of my mother and also all the story. But again, I just brought it up this from the very interesting book of uh, uh, Herbert, the No Time to Grieve for Roses When the Forests Are Burning, which is true. This is a story for all of us. And I, and I know uh, many of you have been involved with many of uh, other issues in your family, but because of COVID-19, we really didn't have a time to even think about it. Um, I wanted to thank you all and, uh, and, um, I really appreciate for, uh, care indeed to, uh, provide this opportunity for education and discussion. And, uh, feel free to email me if you have any question. Uh, I'll be happy to answer you, but, um, maybe we have some minutes if somebody has any questions and we can actually, um, uh, discuss about the question. I'm going to stop the, uh, my share slide here. Okay. And uh, oh, Dr. Ayari, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, you know, uh, for those of us, uh, the, uh, th for those of us that had just jumped in, um, our webinar today was hosted um, by Dr. Ayari. Um, Dr. Ayari, uh, if you are familiar with senior care here in the Bay Area, he is one of our more prominent geriatricians. Um, internationally known, uh, especially in your field, uh, geriatric medicine. Um, you speaking right now, even taking time to, to be an author uh, as on top of being the adjunct clinical assistant professor at Stanford. Um, your work with the Alzheimer's Association and the Stanford Research Institute, it, it all, all of that really puts you in a position uh, to advocate for uh, this population. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up or ask uh, again, uh, and you touched upon it during your, your presentation was, um, yeah, yesterday you were quoted in uh, the San Jose Mercury uh, talking about agitation, significant depression symptoms and weight loss for, for the seniors. Um, they saw that as a, as a, an emotional 
point to make. Um, for those facilities, uh, how do they make that transition? Uh, it's not, a, I mean, what does opening up look like for a community that requires um, all of their uh, residents to stay indoors uh, and, and instead welcome others in? Uh, do you, I know that you do visits as well to, to other facilities and, and consults. Um, when do, do other members of the healthcare team come in um, from all the way from physicians such as yourself, um, home health nurses and, and caregivers, um, the ones that are due allowed, how do you prepare them for that? How do, how do they make that transition? Right. You know, uh, it's a very good question. That was one of the uh, big area of uh, discussion and an argue right now that we have uh, even we wrote a letter to uh, uh, governor as well uh, especially um, my I really wanted to have the care provider uh, especially care managers able to to see their clients and that's very very important for the well being um, you know there there are saying that because of uh, um, uh, we are worried about this but this is excuse the reason is that they should provide appropriate PPEs for for this facilities or the, the, exactly this this population and, and this group of people in order to make them able to go and see them. It's actually very easy. I mean, the other countries, they actually, they've done it. What happened is they, uh, for example, in the facility, they make one designated visitor and they can come once a week to see the person. And in the entrance, they give them appropriate PPEs, which is so easy as a face mask or something to wear and uh, again, um, and they can come inside and they have the education, they clean their hands and they come, see the person, check everything, and then they leave for the period of time. It's so easy if they have it. Definitely there's not able to have like 10 persons come to visit one person. We're not gonna have a birthday party anymore or any other things that we've done it for years. Probably that's gonna be for a long time. But because of in California, we have, I mean, again, the state is so overwhelmed with not having enough tests and not having enough PPEs. They just, the solution is, okay, well, let's just stop everything to visiting the facility, which again, they're, they're, the reason is absolutely right. This is what we actually offered at the beginning of pandemic. We should stop the visiting. But that's what well, we were expecting that that's only going to be a problem for one or two weeks, not for months. And the situation is so far, which I know that, that is going to be probably for another couple months or maybe more that is still not the people able to come and visit the, this 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 group of people in the facilities which is going to be a significant um again um, issue and we are all worried about it we already give the warning about it as we discussed no for people at home uh, we discussed it in the last presentation having appropriate ppes um, which is not going to be complete complex PPEs, but as far as be able to provide these PPEs and um, and they the caregivers able to follow the instructions. Like for example, if they are sick, if they have symptoms, they should not. If they feeling that they exposed to someone with COVID nineteen, you know that that um, uh, even at Stanford at El Camino Hospital, they are offering to all the caregivers, family caregivers, they have a free testing right now. There's no waiting. You can actually go and do the test quickly. They do both blood and also nose test if you want the blood test as well. Um, even for people working in the grocery or 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 um, um, any any persons that um, there are essential, you can actually go and do tests. If you're feeling that any caregivers feeling that they have symptoms or they may expose, they can go quickly do a test and do not go and see somebody till the test results gonna come back. If they go see the person, definitely use a protective device in order to, um, um, again, um, not exposing the person to an infection and also protect themselves as well. Okay. And just going back to a couple things, I, it does seem like um, there were some points made about the infrastructure of, of community living, skilled nursing facilities. What do you foresee? Because I know a lot of uh, a lot of the facilities and, and, and hospitals are consulting you on on the landscape of geriatric medicine. Um, what does it look like for them in the future? Do do these um, facilities do they end up with a place, or does everything seem to be driving back again to um, keeping multi generational homes? This is a good question. First, I, I wanted to first um, saying that um, I 
I also said in my other presentation, I think we should stop blaming uh, each other from what happened so far. Mm -hmm. I know that it's very sad. We, we have many people, 80,000 people have been died so far, but blaming each other is not going to solve the problem. We are facing with the RNA virus, which is smarter than any of us and able to change quickly the structure and makes a lot of people to become more infected. Rather than blaming each other, we should have a strategy for moving forward. I believe COVID-19 taught us um, a very painful, but very valuable lessons, very, very valuable lessons, that what, what is wrong with our system, what we haven't done so far very well, what we need to do moving forward. Um, your, your point is absolutely right. If the COVID-19 is going to be finished and the virus is going to be contained and everybody's going to say, okay, now let's go back to the regular days in the past, this is the biggest mistake that we're going to do. I think what we have learned from this COVID-19 is that we are very vulnerable. Um, we are, we are in the, we, we're living in the country that is the first economy in the world that is not able to provide masks or gowns for their own people. We still, um, we, th these are the things that we learn. We are so dependent. I mean, global economy actually made the big company became so very vulnerable. We even didn't have reagents to do RT-PCR for weeks. I mean, these are the things that we learned from this um, um, uh, lessons that I think COVID-19 was a big shake for us. Um, it, it, it opened all the holes that we were discussing for many years that these are the holes is there, but we didn't pay attention. But finally, we said, no, these are the very serious there. We need to definitely do something. If it's just going to be so sad to see if the virus situation is going to be finished and we go back again to similar situation and regulations, it, it's just going to be, again, as we discussed, going to be very sad. I hope we actually learn from this and we 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 were able to change the entire regulations and we prepare ourselves not only for the outbreak of infection for many other things. You you probably many of you you are in the dementia care industry. Um, do we have qualified dementia facilities in this country that the people really know how to manage a demented patient um, or or person? We don't. Honestly, we don't. They are, they are ex they're extremely well. They're doing great, but they still they don't have enough knowledge and education to how to deal in with somebody with dementia. I think after the COVID-19, we need to really sit. We have we need to bring all the experts on the table and we change the regulations. That's going to help for many generations to really able to improve the elderly care as well in the future. And I think I'm, I'm hoping that we learn from this lesson, painful lesson, but we learned something from. Thank you. Um, we have a question here in the group chat uh, from uh, Karen uh, Lakishman. Uh, she says, mm -hmm. Dr. Ayati, she wanted to thank you for another helpful, informative web webinar um, and offers her condolences for your personal losses. Um, based off of, I, I, I guess, from the your presentation, not direct medical advice, but if an older client has shortness of breath, general fatigue, but not temperature, um, and experiencing it for the first time, um, typically would that person get tested immediately in, in that call? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, quickly. The reason is that older adult people, they not showing the same uh, presentations as younger people. Um, having feeling fatigue, change of mental status, um, um, especially shortness of breath, which is a very red flag, actually. Shortness of breath is the symptoms that we recommend to be transferred to the hospital, um, not because be on the ventilator. I mean, a lot of people, they think about going to the hospital means of be on ventilator. No. In the hospital, as we talk about remdesivir and many other medication, we actually had a very good success for people. They were also not wish, they, their wishes would not be on ventilator, but we able to cure them with a good antiviral medication and they actually came back to the home very well, no, no problem. Even we never try ventilator for them. And that's why I actually say that definitely somebody with shortness of breath and fatigue, this stage needs to be tested. This person can have congestive heart failure, can have a bronchitis problem, many other problems, but definitely this stage needs to be tested for COVID-19. 
Okay. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, and we have another question. Um, when can we expect the antibody test to determine if we've had COVID without knowing uh, for those for, who are asymptomatic? So that's, I, I, I would assume, for those who didn't have the symptoms, uh, went through that period and then went back for an antibody testing. How, is there a, a definitive method for that at this point? Well, the, right now they're checking the IgG and IgM level, which if you are not, if you think that you are exposed, you can actually check. You may have IgG in your blood, and um, and that's actually showing that you're exposed to this virus, but you are you are recovered from it. And that's probably going to be uh, um, the best uh, uh, scenario. And then you, you, you know that you're exposed with that. Again, there is a lot of research, epidemiologic research going on about antibody, but I will say that definitely um, it's a good idea to, to, to be tested, especially for the healthcare providers that you want to see if your body already uh, developed the IgG or not. I personally tested. Stanford actually asked us to all of us to test, and I went and tested, and I was I had nothing. I, my IgG was negative, and my swab test also was negative. Even if I see the patient, is still there. But it doesn't mean it. It it probably means that I haven't been exposed to COVID nineteen, or I've been exposed long time ago, and my IgG already disappeared. Oh, okay.